Well, howdy and good morning. Yesterday I talked a little bit about uh, some of the overall uh, accounting that we've been doing, uh, in particular in energy efficiency areas. Uh, today I'm going to focus on, on renewables. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a separate but, but different uh, accounting uh, that we do as part of our uh, legislative responsibilities. <clears throat> and as before, um, it's, a <clears throat> it's easy for me to give this talk because I, I have great support um, from staff and from students, uh, many of whom are in this room, uh, and, and it can't be done without them. Uh, similarly, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, connections and, and cooperation with, with other state agencies that are participating in this work, and, and these are only growing as we go forward, uh, and those are some of the folks that we've listed here. Um, it, uh, TCEQ, uh, Vince Myler and, and Bob Gifford are currently uh, the program managers there. Uh, of course, um, um, ERCOT is Warren Lasher and um, uh, EPA, gosh, James, I'm sorry, at the national levels, our team, but, but James Yarbrough, of course, is, is sitting right here with us uh, for this region. Um, this is a, a team effort and, and we really have to get things done uh, together uh, to move forward in this area. Um, Renewables in Texas are, are uh, fairly well known. Uh, solar photovoltaics, to a lesser extent, solar thermal, uh, as well as hydroelectric, biomass, landfill gas, and geothermal. Uh, these are, are the majority of, of, of the projects by name, and of course, uh, the legislative um, uh, mandates tend to follow uh, these names. Um, however, Wind is one of the largest renewable sources in the state, uh, due primarily to the, the very judicious investment uh, opportunities that were made early on. Uh, it's grown much larger uh, than any other of the renewables within the state, and, and that's a good thing. Um, it's one of the renewables that, that is, is the easiest for us to track. Uh, because uh, we actually uh, receive the 15-minute uh, files from each of the wind farms uh, from ERCOT. Um, with that data, we can process it and analyze it and, and take a look at uh, just exactly uh, what's happening. Uh, we tend to look uh, in the past six months to 12 months behind, uh, so that's why you're seeing it lagging roughly a year. Uh, within Texas, there's the 10,000 10, megawatts. Uh, that you heard mentioned earlier um, in ERCOT. Um, expanding slightly outside of ERCOT uh, is a little bit more, uh, 10,380 megawatts as, as of um, uh, the beginning of 2012, and it's growing even as we speak. Um, of that, interestingly enough, we're seeing that the peak wind power is, is continuing to grow, as you would expect uh, the sites are are being uh, increased. Um, many of these um, uh, facilities and many of these um, equipment and towers are being manufactured here uh, in the Houston, um, Galveston, Brazoria area, and then they're shipped up on a network of highways that don't have overpasses uh, because these things are huge. Uh, and in the last six months, um, I'm happy to say that they go right past our lab. And it, it's just phenomenal to see these things, uh, truck after truck uh, going past our lab. I think we have an overpass or two they don't fit into, uh, so they have to go around the overpass. Uh, but clearly, um, the peak demand is increasing. Um, on the graph here, what we're showing basically, the banded portions are the ozone season period. Um, that's the important period for NOx emissions reductions, which is, which is the, the big problem here in Texas is ozone uh, during the summer period. Um, during the spring and the fall and the winter, of course, uh, early spring is when we get our largest um, uh, wind. Everybody knows that that lives here in the state. Um, uh, uh, 2,975,145 megawatt hours um, were measured in um, 2011 uh, in the spring, of course. Uh, that doesn't do us any good in the ozone season period. Uh, with the 15-minute data, we can actually look at that information in the ozone season period. And, and you can see that the trend is upwards. Um, it, it, it's pretty much following the installed capacity. Um, in the last period, um, about um, 1.6 million megawatt hours during the ozone season period. So 
It's increasing. And as we've seen previously on, on the hourly slides that we saw yesterday um, from ERCOT, um, it's, it's, it's something that, that we need to um, pay attention to. And at the same time, uh, it's getting large enough that even though it, it's a variable resource, uh, we can begin to predict it. And that's what I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, today. Um, this is the Texas as we know it, uh, map of the counties. Um, this is what the map of the wind farms look like uh, in Texas as of uh, December 2011. Uh, there's roughly, roughly 74 uh, projects as of that date that are completed. Another 42 are um, on the books, so to speak, uh, and we've actually retired one of the projects. Uh, so it, it's continuing to grow. Um, as you can imagine, uh, these projects are in the windy portions of the state. And we're now beginning to see some brave souls uh, putting some wind towers along the Gulf. And, and, um, and we'll hope to see more of that as time goes along. But those need to be uh, specially hardened sites uh, so that if we do have a hurricane, it doesn't wipe out the resource. Um, if we take a look at one of these sites, for example, um, here's what we do uh, to actually calculate the NOx emissions reductions um, and then report that to TCEQ. Um, and then take a look at getting SIP credits from that. Let's look at India Mesa, for example. With the 15-minute data, we can roll that up to hourly data. <clears throat> we don't have very good wind speed information um, at the wind farms. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's like the secret key. Uh, and so it takes money to measure it, and the companies that measure it don't always want to share it right away. Um, however, we have a public resource that's not bad on a daily level, and that's the wind speed that's measured at NOAA. Um, so we can take the 15-minute data, and we can roll it up to hourly data, <clears throat> and you can say to yourself, <clears throat> what kind of a knucklehead would run a regression plot against that? Well, here I am. It's actually pretty similar to what we see in buildings. And it's not bad when you look at the statistics. Um, we have a similar thing that we can do by sorting out through the ozone season period. Um, think about the line at that point. The line is what we take forward with this to actually do the prediction. So the reality of it is, for example, when we do our roll up on the NOx emissions reductions from the wind power, um, we actually have to cast backward into the past. So in other words, in 2011 and 2010, we're using a slightly older version of eGrid to do the analysis. eGrid does the conversion from the megawatts to the NOx emissions reductions from the power plant. So that's why we have to actually develop a, a wind normalized model and then cast backwards into the past. Uh, how well does it work? Uh, remarkably well on the monthly level, um, acceptably well on the daily level, um, not so good on the hourly level. Uh, and the reason why, of course, is that we, we would certainly enjoy getting that hourly wind data at the hub height of the wind turbines at each of the farms, uh, but we're not quite there yet. So this is an example of the monthly level, and you can see during the ozone season period where we have actual measured data versus, versus real data, it does a pretty good job in terms of, of projecting things. Uh, wind speed is the line along the top. Uh, the two bottom lines right there are the differences between the two models. So with that information, we can actually do some things. Keep in mind, we actually have the measured data, and so we can start to answer questions. For example, um, uh, how reliable is the wind? And when you put a wind farm online, does it keep spinning? Uh, well, this is how we do that. Uh, we basically use a rather simple um, uh, analysis. We just use a sliding uh, statistics. Uh, this is data from 2002 uh, up through 2011 for the Indian Mesa. Um, clearly what we see is this is a 82, 82 and a half megawatt uh, rated farm. Um, in the beginning when they brought the thing online, it was about 48 megawatts. They were still adding turbines at that point. Um, now, today, we're at 63, 66.3 uh, megawatts. So when you ask a question about this particular farm, is there degradation? In other words, when you put the thing in and you start running it, years later, is it still running? And of course, because we have the data, we can answer the question, no. 
realistically. Uh, there's more power coming off of this wind farm than there was when they put the thing in the first place. So every single farm that we have the 15-minute date on, uh, we can do this sort of analysis. And so we can look at these and we can say, uh, these things are working. It was a good investment. It continues to be a good investment. That's why we're continuing to see things grow. Um, when we look at how well the weather normalization works, we can see that it, it's worth doing. Uh, for example, uh, with the 2010 measured annual power production, when we cast that backwards to 2008, we use the regression models, we see that we, we get a bit of a bump from 23 million megawatt hours to 25 million megawatt hours, so that was worth doing. Um, interestingly enough, but in the opposite direction, unfortunately, we don't always have control over this, Okay. Um, from 2010, casting backwards to 2008 during the ozone season period, it was a little windier in 2010 uh, than it was in 2008. Uh, so we dropped from 53,000 uh, megawatt hours per day to 45,487 megawatt hours in 2008, which is what we use for egrid. Well, what is egrid? There it is. <laughs> it's just a big old table. Okay, and we work with this table and we've actually rolled a new table for Texas. Uh, where does it come from? It comes from the EPA. That's the decision we made some time ago. Um, and it's, it's data that comes from instruments that are actually in the smokestacks uh, and it's synchronized with uh, similar information from the power that's coming out of the plant at that point so that you get a, a, a NOx emissions reductions uh, per megawatt hour. Um, you can also get other things, uh, for example, SOx and CO2 and particulates. Uh, so there's, there's multiple flavors of, of eGrid, so to speak. Um, this is available on the national website. However, for Texas, we, we have to do some custom uh, things to it. Um, so moving forward from 2007, which was based on a, on a 1999 base year, uh, we've gone to 2010. 2007 also used 10 power control authorities. Uh, in 2010, uh, we're now been moving towards congestion management zones. And there's four of them now, so we've moved from 10 to four. Um, each of those zones are uh, by county. Uh, they look something like that when you look at the mix as to a, Where's the power going? Where's the power coming from? Um, it's complicated, and I don't want you to think that it's just one spreadsheet. It's a workbook. And it's a workbook that's too big to email. So we typically have to put it on a website, and then we share it with people and discuss it. Uh, but at the end of the day, here's what it looks like county by county when you look at the magnitude of the uh, NOx emissions uh, for 2010 uh, for the different zones. So the west zone is in this area, north zone is in this area, Houston has got his own all by itself, and then the south zone are the remaining counties. Uh, that's on an annual basis. Uh, we have two different worksheets, actually, uh, with eGrid. We have the annual numbers, and we have the ozone season day numbers, which are extracted uh, from the annual numbers. A slight difference in, in terms of where the power is coming from during the, the different seasons. Um, with that in hand, then, we can take the measured megawatt hours from a particular uh, site, and we can convert it to wind power. And you can say to yourself, well, isn't that one-to-one? -one? Well, not, not exactly. Uh, when you go back and forth on these. Um, so um, we can also take a look at some of the other power requirements. Uh, I said wind is the biggest renewable in the state, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> the green bar is the wind. Uh, as far as we can measure, the other bars, which you can hardly see on the top, are the other uh, information. Um, this is typically uh, coming off of either the ERCOT or the public utility site. Um, when you do an extraction and you take a look at the other renewables coming on the site, which would be biomass, um, the darker blue, um, hydro, uh, the light blue, uh, and then, uh, sorry, the solar is on the top. It's orange. You can't even see it. Um, what you begin to notice, for example, is that um, even those have variabilities within them. Some of them are predictable. Some of them you expect to see. Uh, for example, uh, we had a drought in 2011. Duh. Yeah. Well, and so there it is, okay? The power from hydro dropped substantially. 
So, you know, this is the kind of information that needs to go back to the policymakers so when we begin to take efforts to make more investments in these things, we can think about what the reliability of this is going to be going forward. So, for solar, for example, we've got uh, information from 3,000 projects uh, around the state. Uh, for solar thermal, a slightly lesser amount. Uh, it's growing. Uh, we need to do a better job of actually accounting for that. It turns out uh, uh, for the solar PV, uh, we're getting some help from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We don't see the same thing from solar thermal. You would think so, but, but it's not quite there. Uh, for hydro, uh, it's a little bit harder to build a hydro facility so that the number of facilities don't change so much from year to year. Um, landfill gas, same sort of a thing. Uh, and of course, geothermal, which is starting to bifurcate into two different issues right now. Legislatively, there is no differentiation between deep well geothermal, um, which you, know, you send down several thousand feet, uh, versus, uh, of course, ground-coupled heat pumps. Uh, which is another way of getting energy from the earth, uh, so to speak. So we're looking at, at tracking uh, both of those. Uh, and the way that we do this, of course, I showed the same graph yesterday. We work with a number of state agencies. We pull the information together um, from the Public Utilities Commission, State Energy Conservation Office, uh, Electric Reliability Council of Texas. We then aggregate those in a uniform way. Uh, and then we predict the NOx emissions reductions uh, for the current year. We're on 2007 using 99 as a base year. We're moving to 2010 using 2008 as a base year. And then we can report those either by program, county, or SIP area. And we can do the same thing on an ozone season period by county, program, or SIP area. So this is the roll-up that we had yesterday. Uh, we're looking at the vast majority, of course, still coming from wind. Uh, that's going to continue uh, into the future, um, and we're seeing a growing amount in the other uh, renewables. Uh, we're continuing to see a large amount in the code compliance, public utility programs, as well as the political subdivisions that report to the State Energy Conservation Office, and other programs that we can quantify and report. Uh, for example, uh, residential air conditioner retrofits, uh, we can actually quantify that because we can get the count on the equipment as it's coming into the state. It's starting to become uh, fairly substantial. Uh, we imagine going forward that other things are going to make a big difference in the state. Uh, for example, yesterday I showed you compact fluorescents, which we believe are going to make a big difference um, as soon as they become widespread. All of this is hanging on our website, uh, so if you need to get the information, you can download it to your heart's content. It's about 1,500 pages a year that we publish. Thank you.